Assalamu alaikum. And to those of you who prefer other greetings, I send to you general greetings and well wishes. And I'll get started with the name of Allah, the compassionate and the merciful. And I testify that there is no deity to worship except Allah, and that Muhammad ibn Abdullah, peace and prayers be on him, is his slave servant and messenger. And I ask Allah to guide our hearts and our tongues and our hands, and I seek his refuge from the rejected Satan and from the evils of disbelief and poverty and from the evils of misleading and being misled and deceiving and being deceived. And I ask him to put benefit in this message both for the speaker and for the listeners. Getting right to it. Um, in this recording and in another recording, I'm going to talk about one of the uh, hidden dangers to um, one of the hidden dangers to being a Muslim. And then, well, two of them, one in this one and the other one in the next recording, Lord willing, inshallah. I will uh, go ahead and point out something that starts off in Surah Baqarah. And in Surah Baqarah, uh, that is the first full chapter of the Quran. And so if Fatiha, meaning, literally meaning the opening, is in fact the... Uh, uh, the prologue, then that makes Surah Baqarah the first full-length chapter. And so uh, I'm going to start with uh, with verse seven. Uh, in verse seven, well, on second thought, I'm going to start with verse six, and I'll explain this to you. Verse five actually says that. Uh, there are those upon right guidance from their Lord, and they are successful. But verse 6 tells us, and I, you can look these up yourselves. I'm paraphrasing because my Arabic is not that good, and I'm not going to, to risk uh, mispronouncing the Quran, especially in front of other people, because this is not a practice session. This is an advice and a recording, an important message. So verse 6 says that uh, it tells us that those who disbelieve will find it the same uh, rather we warn them or don't, don't warn them, they're still not going to believe. Verse 7 says that Allah um, has sealed their hearts in the hearing and put a veil over what they see, their vision, and that there's this great punishment awaiting them. Verse 8 tells us that uh, there are some people who say we believe in Allah in the last day and they aren't believers. Verse 9 is where it really gets interesting. Verse 9 tells us that they think they're going to deceive Allah and those who believe, and they only deceive themselves, but they don't perceive it. Now, verse 10 tells us that they got sickness in the hearts, and Allah increased them in that, and that a punishment is waiting on them for lying. But verse 10, uh, I'm sorry, that's verse 10 that tells us that. Verse uh, 11 tells us that when someone says to them, don't cause corruption in the land, they say, well, we're, we're the reformers or the peacemakers. 12 gets interesting again because it says, unquestionably, or, or certainly, or definitely, it's they who are the corruptors, but they don't perceive it. They don't feel that they're the corruptors. 13 says, when it's said to them, believe as the people have believed, they say, should we believe as the foolish have believed? Unquestionably, they are the foolish, but they don't know it. Um, 14, 14 tells us something. It tells us a sign by which we can know these folks. Not everybody is like this, but there are many of us a lot of us in the Ummah are actually very close to this. 14 says, it tells us that when these type of people meet the believers, they say that they believe. And when they get alone with each other, they say, no, nah, we're together. We were just mocking them. And that's one of the signs. So everybody's not like that. But I want you to understand that uh, what I want you to know is that that is a warning. Because we're close to that, that should be a warning to us. 
because many of us aren't quite at that distance, but that, that, that's not very far from where we are at this point. And this is what I'm getting at. Notice the verses that say that these folks don't even perceive their own evil. What they are telling you is the subconscious mind. First, they tell us that they seek to deceive Allah. So this means there's an intention. They're trying to trick God and then trick those who believe in Allah. And they only wind up deceiving themselves and they don't even know it. That is the subconscious mind right there. That is what is important for us to understand. It's that subconscious mind. People, and I'm sorry to say this, but Muslims are definitely the worst about this. And Arab Muslims are the worst of the Muslims about this. About what? Thinking they have no subconscious mind. Thinking they can't be tricked. Thinking that they're so smart. And people in general are smart. Allah gave us intellect. But we do have subconscious minds. Now, subconscious means you're not aware of it. So this means that we got thoughts and judgments and assumptions. I wouldn't even say thoughts per se, but rather just assumptions and judgments that we make without realizing that we're making them, without thinking of them consciously. Many times, we will answer questions differently based on what we're thinking about at that particular time, even though it's the same question. But what are we thinking about? That which you are not thinking about but still have accepted or believed is in the subconscious. This is dangerous for us. Because what is the hidden shirk? The hidden shirk is the shirk that the Muslim himself does not know that he or she is participating in. Not understanding it. Subconsciously having this shirk. What is this shirk? That shirk, well, one example is white supremacy. That's one example of a hidden shirk. Muslims don't realize that they're white supremacists. But they've taken white folks and the white Western world as a rival to Allah and don't know they've done it. Some people have told me, oh, the Saudis are racist. Um, I beg to differ. I found them mostly to be tribalists and nationalists more so than racist. But why are they like this? How can they talk so much about the religion and act like this? That's the question that people ask me. And I say to them that the question is a valid question to ask, but the answer is going to be unpleasant for all of us. It is because they're not thinking they're doing this subconsciously and we're turning and doing the same thing. You don't believe me? How many Indians do you think are aware consciously that they hate white folks racism against them for being brown and that they think that their own racism against black is perfectly okay and normal and natural. They don't think about it, it's subconscious. When they begin to think critically about it, then naturally it gets out of their system. But when they don't think about it, it stays in the system, it just, they take it for granted. No, no, I'm equal to white people, but I am above black people. Nigga, what? Human beings hold ideas that are stupid as hell because they don't know they got the ideas. Their assumptions. This is what I'm getting at. Why am I mentioning this? I wanted to point out to you that music has something to do with this. You see, we can debate about what kind of music is haram and what kind of music is not. There are types of music that we know are forbidden, all of us know, single-handedly. You could say that we know it subconsciously, or we know it naturally. If we think about it, we know that it's wrong. Certain types of music, because of the content, we know it's wrong. Now, wind and string musics are generally taken as a sign of the last days. Some people say wind and string music some people say that wind and string instruments are therefore automatically forbidden. You know what? I'm not a scholar. I'm not going to get into what the scholars debate. What I am going to say is this. 77% of music at this point now has lyrics either referring to drug use, promiscuity, or violence. So much of the music now that Muslims are trying to defend when they argue against the prohibitions on music contains lyrics supporting or desensitizing the listener to drug use, 
promiscuity or violence. Let me explain a little bit more to you. The subconscious mind goes off of repetition. What you hear enough times will have an effect on you and if it is something that you don't believe it will still have an effect on you. This is real. What you believe will have an effect on you. What you don't believe to be true will still have an effect on you. Why you know that it's not true. Therefore, and this is because of the human being's subconscious mind. You can take images and you can, every time you show someone that image, you associate it with something else and then they will come to naturally associate that image with this other thing. This is why it is that people painted Jesus to be white. Subconsciously, people who know that Jesus was not white will still be affected by the image of the white Jesus that has been pushed on the masses. Just as one example. And this is why it is that we have a prohibition on drawing prophets anyway. That's a good thing. Um, here's another one. And let me explain this right quick. Because music has these repetitious beats and is played frequently at this point, and because it is memorized, people will in fact um, be affected by what it is that they hear enough times. And so if you don't believe that promiscuity is okay, and you don't believe that violence is okay except to defend yourself or somebody else, and you don't believe uh, that um, using narcotics in order to alter your perception is okay, then you must understand that if you listen to lyrics that desensitize this kind of thing, then your subconscious mind will become desensitized to these things and while you don't think it's okay your mind will still begin to think of them as normal and so because you think of them as normal you will think of the other consequences of these things as being normal so for instance you will think that okay recreational drugs they're not right but you know they're normal it's not that big a deal so when someone takes a recreational drug and then gets behind the wheel, drives and kills someone, oh, well, that was an accident. You will say, oh, well, that was an accident, instead of saying, well, if this father mucker hadn't taken the drugs, they wouldn't have killed somebody. That's what you'll say. You will go from one to the other. If... I'm not even going to touch on promiscuity because that is human weakness. And it's not going to go away until people start getting married while they're young. Yes, I know, money's not available to young people, but marriage must be made available until that point. Count on promiscuity, it's going to happen. And to you parents, Muslim parents, I really blame you most of the time. Definitely. Especially if your daughter sets a dowry and you step in and raise it. Then I really blame you. Um, I pretty much blame any Muslim that is not supporting young folks getting married. Maybe to live with their parents, but you know what? Disbelieving parents let their kids have boyfriend and girlfriends, and sometimes they say, well, I'd rather that my child sleep with his or her boyfriend and girlfriend than to go out there and sleep with anybody, or maybe paying someone to do it to satisfy themselves, and then they catch a disease. So, I'm going to let my daughter or my son sleep over with the boyfriend or girlfriend. They'll do that. There are parents that will do that. They will, they will allow one evil to prevent another. But we Muslims won't allow marriage to prevent all the evils. We won't even allow that. We'll talk a good game, but we won't do it. No, I'm going to go ahead and jump to the next subject. Violence. When you listen to things that desensitize the listener to violence, you become desensitized to violence. You hear about someone beating someone else up, maybe your child gets into a fight that they picked and beats the other person senseless and you brush it off. Well, you know, kids will be kids. No, 
Uh uh. When your children reach teenage years and they pick a fight with someone, that's the time to put your kid in the hospital. Because if they're picking fights, they're going to put someone else in the hospital. You reach teenage years, you are physically grown. You can do some serious damage to somebody else. I've taken blows to the head and forgotten things. And I've punched people in their heads and watched them make stupid decisions afterwards. These are, this is serious. And if the music that you listen to glorifies these things and you don't do them, you still become desensitized to them and you think of them as normal even though they're not right. When these things become normal, then righteousness becomes abnormal and it only gets worse from there. It starts with the Muslims not protecting their subconscious minds because they think they don't have a subconscious. They're too smart. The Muslims underestimate the propaganda of our enemies and overestimate themselves. I'm going to touch upon more in the next recording, inshallah. In this case, that I, I hope that this message has been of benefit. Assalamu alaikum.